to you. Yeah, my praise goes out to you.
tested in the trial and the shame one week remains one thing one thing remains your love your love never fails never gives up never runs out on me your love
this portion, a portion of this message that the Lord gave me, I spoke on this uh, uh, in times past, but the Lord has kind of moved it around a little bit here for me today. He, for whatever reason, he needs me to bring this message to you guys here tonight. Uh, I've entitled it, uh, Holy or Full of Holes. Holy or Full of Holes. Um, you know, when, I, when, I, when I've been watching this last few days, like what Pastor was talking about, these, uh, what's going on in the Middle East, and when you actually see the videos of, of when the people were at a, in, Israel, uh, in Jerusalem or Israel, some up there, and they were having a big festival or something, they started shooting at them. And it showed all the, some of the videos of some people getting shot and people just running crazy, running for their lives. Uh, as I was watching the videos, uh, the first night that it happened, I was watching some videos, and then the Lord began to show me something. I'll show with you what that is in a bit. And then I started looking closely at the videos the next morning because of what the Lord brought to my attention. And um, well, let me show what the Lord showed me. He showed me that um, whether, how it's going to come about, I don't know. But whether it, if there's chaos, in other words, I've seen chaos. And in the midst of the chaos, people did not know what direction to go. They had no understanding they did not know how to move. You know, they did not know what to do. There was a lot of chaos. And the Lord showed me men that he had prepared ahead of time. That were able to stand in the midst of the mess. That God would anoint supernaturally with an unction of his power. On the tongue of the men. To be able to speak and to stand and give counsel and understanding that only comes from the glories of heaven. To those that for that moment have none and don't know where to go and don't know what to do. So I said, man. So when the Lord showed me that, I began to, I, I, I was watching those videos. I, I deliberately began to watch them again and I, I began to see something that I hadn't seen before. I seen the people running with their families, husbands and wife grabbing kids. People were running away from the actual shooting that was taking place. But then if you look carefully, you seen one, two, or three people out of the hundreds that weren't running away. They were running toward it. I was like, man. They were running toward it because they were looking for the people that they were ahead of that were falling back for whatever reason, couldn't make it. And they were going back to help them. So instead of running away from the harm or from the mess, not even knowing what's really going on, but they knew something was going on, and they ran toward it. I said, man, that's it right there. And I told God, I want to be those that run toward it. That when everything goes wrong and people don't know what to do. So I talked to my wife, and I, 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 I talked to her, I told her, you know, if something ever goes wrong, I mean, you can run to the hills. I'll set you up with my family up in the mountains. I, you, you can run to the hills. But I said, I ain't going. I said, I'm not going. I said, I'm going to stay because when everybody else is running, people need Jesus. There's going to be a time where people won't understand and they're going to need the power of God. They're going to need the anointing of God. They're going to need the righteousness that only comes from the glories of heaven. And there's got to be somebody. There's got to be people that are willing to stay amongst it. That were willing to stay in the middle of it. Not preaching that part of my notes, but like we talked about well, a few months ago with... with um, um, uh, Paul and Silas when they went to the jail. And we talked about that when they, they decided to stay, even though everything was, they were released. The, the chains were, uh, the fetters were broken off and the, the, the doors were open and they chose to stay. They chose to stay that God would complete the miracle amongst the lives of those that were within that cell. So my prayer has been to God, Lord, I want to be those that, that stay behind to be able to help those that are in need. Um, you know, as men, we, we, all of us desire to be, in reality, to be the, the priest of our home. We desire to be in charge, so to speak. We've always done that. We, we, that's, what we, that's what we should be doing, but that's what we want to do. We always want to um, be the one that everybody listens to, maybe the, the, uh, the leader within our household. Uh, if you want to say, for lack of a better phrase, the king of the castle. You know, we always want to be that. But for so many, it hasn't fared well. It hasn't fared well for many folk where they, it's obvious that they're not in charge. 
And for whatever reason, uh, the spouse and the children are not adhering to the leadership or to the council, you know, and it, just, it hasn't, it hasn't um, fared well. And when the Lord was speaking that into my spirit that it hasn't fared well, I, I didn't understand for a minute. And I said, God, you need to, you need to tell me why. And I, I, I began to think, you know, of my own, what I understand. You know, of course, it could be alcohol, drugs, or dad's got anger issues, or dad's got, you know, pride issues. It could be all those things. And, and I began to put some of those things down. And the Lord just says, wipe them out. I'm like, well, no, I ain't got nothing then. The Lord says, wipe them out. And the Lord began to give me some, began to like, I would say, began to download some passages upon me to, uh, uh, to say why, you know, sometimes it doesn't fare well within our own home and others around us within our body of Christ, the church or at work where people don't see us um, that way. And, you know, and we wonder why. And this is what the Lord showed me. And I believe it's because the first thing is um, we've never really served. Let me tell you what, let me tell you what the Lord showed me about that. We've never really served. And we want to jump to leadership real quick. It's kind of like um, when somebody's given a pastoral position and they're wanting everybody to submit to that pastor's authority or to their leadership. And it's, a, it's an urban church and, and that pastor has never done anything for those that are lost and the homeless and people that are in need. But they're given a position real quick. And the body of Christ many times understands that but doesn't always support that. Doesn't always support it. I believe that every pastor that needs, to, needs to do the footwork first. I mean, if you're going to be, a, if you're going to be a, a man of God, you know, preaching the gospel, you better, you better, you better have been on the streets. You better have been helping people. You better be living that way now. You got to have that heart. If you're going to be preaching the gospel, you're going to be telling others, you better have that heart that way. And the Lord gave me the first passage in Matthew 20, 27 to 28. And it should be on your screen. Hopefully it's on the screen. Matthew 20, 27 to 28. And whosoever will be chief among you let him be your servant even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many that's why you've heard me say it many times and I might get in trouble with this you know but I don't believe pastors need to be served pastors need to serve yeah, I don't, don't get me wrong. I honor the position, but I don't, I don't reverence the man. I only reverence the father. I don't reverence, I don't reverence man. So stay with me. I'm not mad at nobody. Just stay with me. <laughs> you see, because um, when you have a, a secular job, which hopefully most of you do, or it's your own business, you go to work every single day. And if you work for an employer, I don't like to use the word boss. Nobody's my boss. It might be my employer. I don't got a boss. I don't got a boss right there. I don't call nobody your boss. So you got an employer. And that employer tells you, you need to, this, is what, this is your job title. You need, this is what you do, 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 do. And you're getting paid to do that, so you do your very best to make that happen. If you don't do that, then yeah, you're gone. Or... Yeah, or a big cut and pay or something. They're not going to say, oh, yeah, you can come in anytime you want. Hang around, take a two-hour lunch and don't do nothing. I'll still pay you for the year. That ain't going to happen. If you find that job, brother, tell me immediately, brother. <laughs> you work eight to 12 hours a day, sometimes longer, and you're, you're, you're doing what you know you're supposed to do. But this is what the part I've shared with you before. But what if, what if you did social service work? What if you were uh, you had you had, you call the shots in a social service office and you're the one that determined who got housing and gas vouchers and you're the one that had the stack of the gas vouchers right here and you were the one that decided who got EBT and who didn't. Some of you feel it already, huh? I got mine right here. But you did that from nine to five. And you had no problem in helping the people with their gas vouchers, housing, with their EBT cards, as you issued them to them from 9 to 5. No problem. Have a good day. God bless you. Have a good, you know, whatever. 
But what if you're at home already at 6 p.m., 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 p.m., 12, 1 o'clock, 2 in the morning, and you start getting knocks on the door. Hey, when am I getting my EBT card? Because they know where you live. Hey, you said I was going to get housing. Hey, come on. I want to talk to you about the housing you're going to give me. Most of you, you need to get back or I'm going to let my dogs go. If you're doing that from 9 to 5 and that's your job, and they're coming to your house, which in reality, you don't even have the right to do that unless you're at work. It feels more like harassment now. And it becomes a bother when it's at your house, when it's after 5, when it's out of your realm, your atmosphere of, of, of the help that way. But you've got no problem doing it from 9 to 5. Don't talk to me during lunch, though. We've got no problem doing it from 9 to 5. But after 5, when I'm at home, don't, 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 don't talk to me. So many people have that mentality in ministry. We have that mentality in ministry. We're real quick to serve God. We're, we're, we're awesome as ushering and greeting and teaching. And we're awesome in the outreach ministries on whatever day we do that at your church or here, wherever you're at. Distributing food, passing out flyers, blessing those that are in need. We're real quick to do that. But once the outreach is over and I'm at home, don't come over, don't call me, don't text me about nothing. We're real quick to have that same mentality, the nine to five or the ministry time frame. But don't call me at home. Don't bother me when I'm with my wife and my kids. We're real quick to have that type of mentality. I'm telling you right now, the Lord is raising men, and you're going to see a, a, an unction of the power of God upon men that in reality, you will begin to, before you see, and I, I'm, I'm, they'll show me, before you begin to see the power of God moving the lives of men, you're going to begin to see, the Lord told me, a servant first. You're going to see a man that, that wants to serve God and do for others. And it will be evident to the people of God's hand upon that man or upon that woman. And the people will automatically hand you the position. Because you're a servant of the Father, thus blessing the people first. Stay with me. You're blessing, you become a servant first. In the, in, the, in the kingdom of God, doing God's work, there's no such thing as part-time Jesus. There's no such thing as nine to five ministry. It ain't, it ain't, it ain't all, uh, uh, no Jesus during lunch. And no, no, no ministry after hours. I don't care if you're at, 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 at Outback Restaurant or at Red Lobster with your wife and have an intimate... <laughs> And the Holy Ghost says, I need you to stand outside for a minute. I need you to walk out to your car for a minute. That ain't God. That's the devil. <laughs> if you position your ministry from nine to five, you're not going to hear the voice of God. We need to be in a position that no matter what you're doing, you hear the voice of God. And you say, God, I hear that. I don't know why you're asking me to go outside by my car for a minute, but I'm going to do that. And you step outside and you say, now I know what God has called me to come outside. Um, I'll uh, tell you something I told Brother Mark. I won't get to tell nobody nothing, but I'll just tell you. Um, you know, I got my brothers with me that, that pray with me in the morning and and I went from three, then to four, then to five, because I want to do a little work out in the morning and exercise and all that. And, and then pray, you know, that, that, and which is awesome, read the Bible. And I'll tell him, Mark, this morning, uh, Mark Lobo, to pray for me because, um, and God does that to me. And I'm like, God, you sure that's you? I'm just being straight with you. I'll say, God, I need to know that's you. Man. Because sometimes I feel like I'm dumb. I'm going to miss it. I'm, or sometimes I deliberately say that, it's not God. And the Lord spoke to my spirit says, when you get up at, at, at like yesterday, I, I was up already at 12.15 in the morning. I stayed up and prayed, and I, I was up at 12.15. And 
And the Lord says, I want you to now to get up that early and I want you to come and pray on the, around the blocks. I want you to walk around the blocks here, around the, around the, around the church. I want you to come stand outside and, and I want you to begin to walk these blocks at that early and pray. I'll be here. I don't want you to pray. I want you to pray over here. So right now, I talk, and then I talk, God, God, I, I don't know if that's you. <laughs> God, I, I, so that's the flesh. I bind this flesh in the name of Jesus. And sometimes I don't understand why God would have me do that. I don't. I wish I could say, I know why. I mean, I could say, oh, that the power of God will move in the Wilson. I don't, I don't know. That's not what's in my mind. That's not what's in my heart. But the Lord told me to do something. I said, okay, that's what I'm going to do. And many times we have the mentality of that, you know what, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna be inconvenienced. I'm not gonna be uh, put out because that can't be God. Matthew 24, 45 says this. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? It says faithful and wise, both. It doesn't say just one, it says both. Faithful and wise. Whom the Lord hath made ruler over his household. Hmm. For what? To give them meat in due season. And I read this, I read this passage a thousand times. And every time I would read this and time has passed, it's different from the Lord gave this to me yesterday and today. I'm thinking, yeah, the going to work and feeding the kids and feeding your wife and make sure everything happens. And the Lord put it in my spirit. He goes, I'm not talking about food. And the Lord began to remind me the seasons where my wife was having a difficult time. And began to remind me seasons that my kids were going through stuff. And I wasn't always feeling good. And the Lord put me in a position to be able to, to feed them. To feed them spiritually, to minister to them in a way that could only come from the glories of heaven. Not because of man, but because of what God was doing through me during that time. To position myself, faithful and wise servant, who the Lord has made ruler over his household, to give them meat. The Lord talks about that. He says, there's some folk that, that, that are still uh, drink breast milk. Yeah, I've preached that a bunch of times. Yeah, brother, don't get me mad right now. Some brothers serving God for 20 years are still sucking on titi. Yeah. Yeah, you got, your lips are like, mm. <laughs> serving God for 20 years and still want breast milk. Yeah. Oh, no, I don't, I know. I'm a meat eater. I, I'm a meat eater. Yeah, you might not be sucking on breast milk, but you've been, you've been using that, the electric breast pumps and you got that extra milk stashed in your trunk. And your saddlebags and your bike. <laughs> the Lord talks about that. He says, it's time that you know what? We, we, there's a time it's okay if, if you're young on the Lord to, and I'm going to say it like this, to drink titi. It's okay to do that if you're young on the Lord. But the Lord says, there's a time when we grow up. <sighs> and you got canines now. Not that, that, that. You can't, be, you can't be sucking on titi with, with, with canines, brothers. Part your whiskers to get in there. The Bible says, I'm just paraphrasing, there's a time where you, you stop drinking breast milk and there's a time where you start chewing meat. Matthew 24, 45. There's got to be a time that we let go of that Pacify. Oh, Lord, give me a message on a pacifier. I'm not going to preach it right now. Oh, Lord, give me the message the other day. I just started praying. Lord says, I need you to tell. Them. I'm not going to say it. On the, in the Spanish, you call it the chupon. Yeah, the pacifier. The chupon. Amen. None of my grandkids use the chupon. I said, you better get. No chupon is in my house. Amen. We cannot treat our relationship in, with Christ as we do our job. We can't do the ministry. We can't, we can't try to shift the ministry like we do 
our job. Mark 9.35 says this. And he sat down and called the twelve and said unto them, If any man desires to be first, the same shall be last of all and servant of all. Man. So he told his disciples, if you want to be first, he's saying position yourself as the last and serve everyone. But many times we only want to serve the people that we know will bless us back. That will give us something in return. Yeah. It says bless, serve all, not some, everybody. And that's up to you what that's definite, what that means. <laughs> it's clear in the scripture challenge if you desire to be that man of God, that the family identifies you that way. And those around you see you that way. And they willingly hand you that position and acknowledge you as the man of God. You have to first be the servant. So don't expect your wife and your kids to always listen to you if you never serve them. Oh, but they're on the king. They have to. No, well, you got it wrong, brothers. You, I, I've, said, I've, heard, I've said it before, but you know, I, I'll say it again. Many of us have this thing backwards because we always. We always put the wife, the, the female, to do all the house cleaning, to raise the kids, to do all the cooking, wash the clothes, and some of us, some of us, whatever. And then the, and many, many times the discipline, and, and, and the wife raise the kids and take care of them and comb their hair and send them to school and, and all that kind of stuff. But that's not biblical. The Bible says that the man is supposed to raise the children. The man is supposed to teach them. The man is supposed to discipline them. The man is supposed to guide them. What does the woman do? She just helps the man to do that. But the man fails to understand that. Thus we fall out of line. But yet we want them to submit and to see us as a man. But we've never served them. We always say, you need to serve me. The man of God needs to understand that. That we serve first. 1 Corinthians 9.19 says this. For though I be free from all men. Yet have I. This right here is what messed me up. Yet have I made. Myself. Servant unto all. That I might gain. The more. It doesn't seem to be practical. The sense of the way human race thinks. And of our understanding to say. How can I serve and serve others that because of that, I will gain all the more? Like we're 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 8, 9, and 10, where, where the apostle Paul went to uh, the Lord about the thorn in the flesh. And the Lord says, then, then tells him all that, no, because my, you know, my grace is sufficient. Then Paul said, therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmity, my reproaches, my persecutions for when I am weak. He said, don't forget this. He said, then... I am strong. So to position yourself that way, he says, when I am weak, because my reliance is upon the Lord, my faith, my trust is in God. And the strength that only comes from the glories of heaven becomes evident. So we have to understand how to be able to think that way. Amen. Amen. There's so many that in reality, there, there are uh, so many ways that we can be very effective in serving others. But I believe there's only one way, I believe, uh, that those folks will literally hand that to you. And that once again, it is to be a servant first with your family and not something that can be forced on you as a pastoral position or a leadership position. Because you will do that and people will sometimes follow you, but they won't follow you. They won't listen. They, will be, they won't be in a position to be uh, ministered to. Amen. When you go to a uh, pastor, and I believe this is, this is, this is a way that. That God has shown me in all these years I've been here. I've been here at Cornerstone 35 years. And I've been in frontline ministry all those years. So we, we haven't taken a year off. We haven't taken three months off, a month off, six months. We've been in frontline ministry 35 years. And I've been on pastoral position 29 years. So it's been that way. It's been that way. And there are so many times that, that I'm, wanting to, I'm wanting to switch and go my direction. And I did that. And it didn't work. 
But when I learned to submit to my pastor, even when I didn't feel like I needed to do that, or I felt like I could, or I, I didn't want to do that, I did it anyhow. And when I learned to help my pastor to put legs on the vision that my pastor had been given from God, the Lord answered all mine. When I put legs on my pastor's visions, the Lord blessed me with all of mine. So when you find a leader or a pastor that you trust and you're willing to submit to them uh, under their authority, that's what God will begin to do in your life now. That because when everything gets ugly, you're not going to be the runner, but you're going to run toward it. And God's going to use you supernaturally when sometimes you might not even see it now. Because I'm telling you right now, as this whirlwind that we're in right now in a lot of different lives, your children are going to go through some stuff. Your spouse is going to go through some stuff. You're going to have family members go through some stuff. And whether you like it or not, whether you believe you can do it or not, you're going to have to be in a position. I'm not saying to feed them meat, but to minister to them in a way that no other human being can. not And the reliance is going to come back to you. God will use you. It's going to be the Lord doing it, but he's going to use you. Don't make your wife or your kids go to another man. Don't make your wife and your kids go look for a godly man somewhere else because we can't step up with who God has called us to be in our own home. Make sure we understand that what I'm saying. When you so the process of submitting to somebody that you trust and to their authority now is what God's gonna see to to have an understanding so we can say, you know what? Everybody around us can see that we're doing things according to the to the body. Amen? Amen. Without hesitation, because when you submit to somebody you trust and and you're accountable to them. It's, it's awesome because let me tell you, kids, gentlemen, see, when you're not, when you want to, when, I mean, don't get me wrong. You can do ministry. You can preach on the streets. You can do it. And, and, and people get say, whatever, whatever, whatever. But when you're out there as a lone ranger, not submitting unto your pastor and to the leader that God has placed to you within that body as well, we will have a tendency to only do in ministry what we feel we can accomplish by our knowledge, understanding, experience, or we feel good doing We will do what we feel good in doing in ministry because we're lone rangers and we don't submit to nobody's authority. But when you fall into the leadership of a man of God that way that you trust, you see that man, if he's hearing from God, you might be doing that ministry you love. You're like, hey, he goes, come here, I'm going to pull you. What do you mean you're going to pull me? Yeah. I don't want you teaching that class tonight. I need you in the parking lot watching the cars, but you're going to be way over there in the corner in the back. There's no street light, but I need you over there watching the cars over there. I ain't doing that. I'm a man of God. And I'm a theologian. I know passages. I know scriptures. I know verses. I love God. I'm not going to be out in the parking lot over there. I'm not going to do that. Just that in itself tells me you would fail as a Lone Ranger. Because we don't know how to submit to the authority of somebody else. You see, because that's what happens sometimes. And I've shared this before. I'll tell some of the men, some of my leaders, I'll tell uh, general those guys, that I'll, I, what I'll do is I'll have somebody, if, if, if somebody makes a big old mess in the bathroom, <laughs> I'll say, bro, come here, can you go clean that? Yeah. They don't even know yet. <laughs> and they go in the bathroom. I ain't doing that. Okay, then get out of the way. I'll do it. And I do it. You see, what that does, that tells me something. If, I, if, if, if God has given the leadership the position to make decisions under his, anoint, under his anointing, to make decisions to raise leaders, then he's going to give me the ability to see the cream. You hear what I'm saying? He's going to give us the authority and the ability to see the cream that rises. I'm going to pick based on the cream. And what I mean by that are those that are willing. So sometimes I would deliberately ask somebody to do that because I want to see if they kick and buck. I, I, I want to see if they're going to kick and buck. Because if they kick and buck, I don't want them with me in the foxhole. I don't want this full, full, full throttle battle. I don't want to run toward it and they're running away. I don't want... <laughs> you ever... You ever 
I mean, I have. You ever, you ever back in the days getting a fight, and you, you, sometimes it's two or three of you guys, and, and a, I mean, how many, I'm going to tell you like this, how many of you ever been like in a full-fledged brawl, man, two, three, everybody hitting it, like a, I have, you know, like, man, it's like, like you would in a bar, like on a gun smoke or something, you know, <laughs> and, a lot of, and, and I've been with the guys that are doing that, and it always seemed like a one of the guys, mm, he's back here just, Oh, oh word. And this one guy's over here like, oh, I was going to back you up if he. I mean, literally, after everything's done, let's sock this dude up. I mean, no, I'm not trying to be funny, but you see what I'm saying? Something comes up that I'm like, why? That's the exact same way I feel spiritually, brothers. Sometimes I feel that everybody runs. We need to run toward it. The Lord says the gates of hell will not prevail. See, the gates, he told Peter, gates are a defensive position. In other words, he's saying the gates of hell will not prevail. He'll let you allow to move into the, the enemy territory. And whatever, whatever gates the enemy puts up against you, he says they will not prevail. He goes, I'll give you the ability no team, to trample that gate and go inside the enemy's territory because his gates will not prevail. Remember, gates are a defensive position. But we see what the enemy is doing and we run the other way. Stay with me. So when, you, when you're accountable to a leader, the Lord begins to use that leader, especially if you're one that God is going to use, he will use that leader to make some changes in your life to see where you're going to stand, see what you're going to do. If you're going to kick him buck, you want to see the cream. The Lord will do that with that leader, that pastor that you're submitting under. To see what you're going to do, because if you're, if, you're, if you're not willing to submit right now with this part here, this small thing right here, you ain't going to make it a full-fledged brawl. You're going to run. You're, gonna, you're just going to go the other way, amen? So once again, when you come along with a pastor, but you got to be a pastor you trust. I mean, if the pastor's always telling you, come, 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 I'll cut my lawn. Bring weed or come cut the weeds. I don't have nobody do that for me, brothers. You know, don't, don't, I mean, I'm not saying don't do that, but. But you know what I'm talking about? Okay, thus comes in the border collie. Border collie, the dogs. And I've shared a portion of this message before. Because when you see a border collie doing its job up in the mountains when he's guarding, when he's leading sheep, when you see a border collie, and I, I, I've talked to him when I preached this message years ago, I, I actually spoke to a couple of shepherds online. I talked to them about their dogs. I wanted, to, I wanted some facts. And when you see a border collie doing his job, you can have 50, 60, 100 sheep, and they'll, get, they'll have two sometimes border collies. And the border collie will, will stay where the, where the shepherd is, and the sheep are running over there, and the, the, the shepherd will, won't talk to them. He'll just go, a certain whistle, boom, they take off. And they take, they take off, and I see them going and, uh, like that. And all of a sudden, they're, they're going, and then they're doing something, the shepherd goes, and all of a sudden, they do something different, and they stand like that. And the shepherd is making other whistles, and they're, both of them are going like this. And they're bringing the sheep exactly where he wants them. And the shepherd will make another noise, and boom, they bring them in into the pen. Okay. I called my friend Chandler. A lot of you know Chandler Kerr. He moved to Oklahoma. That's Pastor Franklin's brother-in-law. He married Pastor Franklin's sister, Donna. And he told me a story years ago, and I called him and talked to him again a little while ago. I said, I need you to tell me the story again because I want to share it with the men. It has to do with his dogs. And he had some big King Corsos. And before those, uh, he had some, uh, no, it was before him, his neighbors had some uh, border collies. And he told me both stories. And he said that the border collies, his neighbor's border collies, um, the neighbor had some sheep, but the sheep were running around and the border collies got loose and chased the sheep, but the sheep had little, I guess you call the little lamb babies. And the border collies were like doing their job without nobody telling them nothing. They were moving around and running the sheep around, but they began to bite at the, cause they're, they're, just, they're, they're, they're trained to nip to get the sheep to go where they want. They're trained to nip at the back of the feet to get them to move. But what the border collies were doing, they were drawing blood on the lambs. 
They were drawing blood on the lambs. Chandler just told me, Kabarga, he told me, he goes, he goes, and so he said, that was my neighbor. He said, he came around, those are his own dogs. He says, he came around, he parked his truck in front of my car, and he called his sheep in, I mean, his, his border collies in. He goes, and he had a, he said a 30 out six. Chandler said, Tony, he said a 30 out six. If you, he asked Chandler, you see Chandler asking, but tell you the story. He had a 30 out six rifle, and he put it on the, on the hood of the car. And the border collies came in, eh, all happy. Boom! Boom! He killed them both. You see, when you're called under the leadership of a man of God, a shepherd, the shepherd will spiritually tell you, and you're going to have to move according to the vision of the shepherd. You'll nip to get the people, the ministry, the body to where they need to be. But some sheepdogs draw blood. And they cause more harm amongst the shepherd, amongst the sheep, amongst the body than good. I can't use them. You're off ministry. You're done. I can't use you that way. Because you're causing more injury to the people than you are a help when you understand the aspect of being a servant first not called to cause injury amongst the sheep not called, called to gossip and talk trash about leadership or about your, your spouse because when you're doing that you're causing more injury you'll never be the cream you won't rise that way you can't use you that way stay with me you guys are getting real quiet on me Almost done. Because uh, his, his, his king corso, the big king corso, he had two. He had two of them. They got out and um, they killed a cow. And he had to deal with the cow. He, you know, he had, to, he, had to, he had to deal with the cow. He had to pay the guy for the whole. The cow wasn't dead, but he had to pay for the cow because the king corso was chewed up all its face. So what I'm saying is this. If, if you're called... To minister, you're under a church, you go to another church, you're under a pastor. You need to be very careful how you submit that way. Listen, be attentive, don't complain. Because he's given instructions that way, amen? amen. You're never going to be first in the eyes of the Lord until we first learn to submit. Almost done, Hebrews 13, 17 says this. Obey your leaders and submit to their, to their authority. They keep watch over you as men who must give an account. Obey them so that their work will be a joy, not a burden. For that would be a no advantage to you. I'm not telling you to serve pastors. I'm telling you to serve the Father, serve the Lord. Because that pastor should be doing the exact same thing. That pastor should be a servant. That pastor should be serving God and doing kingdom work. But the Lord will speak to him about that body, about the vision, the direction that body needs to go. And sometimes the pastor will speak it like my pastor. I'm with, I, see, I sit with him every day. We talk all the time. And sometimes he will, he will say something that he doesn't realize he's saying. But he will cast a vision in front of me and I heard it. And he wasn't even telling me to do nothing. He would just, he said something that the Lord, I said, ooh. And I'll do my best to put legs on those visions without him having to say, this is what I want you to do. I heard a... Yeah. But you can't draw blood. You can't draw blood. So be very careful because I'm saying Lord's raising men now that are not going to run from the, from the fight. That are not going to run from what is really scary and what's really uncomfortable. But they're going to run toward it.